I believe I will be using the overhead. I never know how fast I uh, am going to go, but uh, maybe just a word. Um, since tomorrow is uh, Independence Day. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what the American War for Independence was about. It really wasn't a revolution. It's a poor word because the American founders believed that the British were the revolutionaries, that they were taking away the rights that God had given them uh, under the English Constitution because Alfred the Great, the first English king, was Christian. The English common law began with the Ten Commandments. England had already strayed from its Christian heritage. But the men and women who came to America, mostly English background, English educated, uh, knew that liberty depended on God. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom, Second Corinthians 3, 17. And so America was founded uh, and blessed only, not because we were white, not because we were English or German or whatever, uh, but because any group of people of any color, of any background, of any ethnicity, uh, if they will believe God and if they will use the law of God as the law of the nation they will be blessed we are losing our blessing because we are losing the law of the Lord as the basis for our law no longer do lawyers study the Federalist Papers um I, in every class I taught, I, not quite, but at least if it had anything to do with Ameri American history or American government, or I always lectured on the Federalist Papers because uh, Madison and Jay and Hamilton wrote those in defense of the Constitution. But they understood that a Christian concept, the most important Christian concept, was behind American government and freedom could only be maintained if they understood that and it is that all men are sinners Madison said in, in Federalist 10 if men were angels no government would be necessary if angels were to govern men no controls on government would, would be necessary but since men are not angels and even Christians can sin. Therefore, there must be, we must have a government of laws and not of men. We don't even understand that phrase anymore. It's not taught. None of these things that I'm saying to you right now are taught anymore in our school system except for some Christian schools and maybe some uh, private education. But they understood, all of our founders understood. I could, I could quote you hundreds and hundreds of quotes from myriad uh, of the founders, most all of them, they understood. John Adams said that we must be governed by a Christian people, a Christian people who have the internal moral restraint of Jesus and the Holy Spirit within, internally, so that thou shalt not steal is written in our hearts. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's written in our hearts. It's not just a law that's, yes, we put it on our laws, 
But if you have to depend on the force of law to keep people in order, under control, under moral control, you will lose control eventually. And that's what's happening. Riots are beginning even all over the world, even in American cities where you see uh, the, the, they are, are, are getting on Facebook and, and Twitter and teenagers in Chicago and Philadelphia and various places uh, have ascended on uh, a, a, a shopping mall and maybe three, four hundred, five hundred just overwhelm and then go in and just, just steal and create mayhem. But you see, that kind of, that kind of, you can't, you don't have enough police. De Tocqueville, who, who wrote Democracy in America, was amazed. He wrote it in 1829. He came to America. He's a Frenchman. He couldn't believe. He said, I've never seen a country where there's so much law and order and so few police. Because the law of God is written in their hearts. And if you don't have a Christian moral people with internal moral restraint, you can't get enough external restraint to keep order. And this is the fundamental reason why the Constitution, while the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were written. And so I didn't intend to say that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I just felt... Uh, that I should say it. Now, um, we have been talking about the Antichrist spirit and, and the, the alliance between the radical left, the Marxist uh, progressive liberal left, and radical Islam. Because they both see capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, led by Two nations, they think, Israel and the United States. Israel and the United States to the left and to radical Islam as well. Israel and the United States are the small and the great Satan. They are the ones that have caused a few people to gain most of the wealth and impoverish the rest of the world. It's all a lie. It's all a lie. It's a massive lie. But... Uh, it's believed by a lot of people. Now, I want to try to give you the answer and I, uh, that the Bible has to this Antichrist spirit. Because the Antichrist will come. The Revelation says he will, for at least for three and a half years, control the entire world. And so there will be a control temporarily uh, of the entire world, of every nation. So it's coming. So what is the answer? What is the biblical answer? Now, let me kind of summarize it. And so then when I, as I go along today and then uh, in another month come back and we'll continue on because I won't be able to finish this today. Uh, let me give you a kind of a summary of what I'm going to say for the next, this time and next time at least. Uh, it is that the Bible says well, Matthew twenty four fourteen. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to every nation, to every nation, as a witness. Then the end will come. So, when you read Matthew twenty four and all those verses between uh, verse one and, and uh, verse fourteen. And you see wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and riots and, and all kinds of things. Remember, those things are not the end. The end is when the gospel of the kingdom, God gets the last word. Amen. Satan doesn't get the last word. God gets the last word. And the more evil is poured out and the more sin where sin abounds, grace superabounds. I mean, God, you can't, you can't outdo God. <laughs> and we're going to find out how awesome the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are. We even, we, we even we spirit-filled Christians, we 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 don't understand the awesomeness of God. We do not understand the holiness of God. We, I mean, we we. 
we get glimpses of it, but I mean, we just, we just don't understand it. But the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom is going to be done under the anointing of the sevenfold spirit. I will be talking especially about the anointing of the sevenfold spirit, which will produce the restoration of the tabernacle of David on the earth. Which will produce the restoration of the tabernacle of David on the earth. And the tabernacle of David represents in the scripture, we'll be looking at Amos, and in, in Amos chapter 9, we'll be looking at, at several things that relate to this. But the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom under the anointing of the sevenfold spirit will bring the restoration of the tabernacle of David. And basically what that is, is the Shekinah glory presence of God in the third heaven, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, manifesting it, uh, themselves on the earth in a full way in a magnificent, powerful way that will totally defeat Satan and all the Antichrist spirit. And so it is God's direct intervention. God's going to intervene more directly uh, here at the end than at any time maybe since the flood. Well, maybe since the giving of the Ten Commandments. Probably the Ten Commandments is is a good example because uh, that's where on the 50th day, Penta means 50th. On the 50th day after they came through the Red Sea, the manifest glory of God the Father was manifested. The mountain shook. There was an earthquake. There was fire, lightning, and thunder. And the people thought they were going to die. And then God spoke. I mean, God, that's how God created. And God spoke. And God said. And out of nothing... Everything came into being so that as God moves and speaks, speaks what's here but speaks beyond that more directly to us, then there will be the restoration of the tabernacle of David where we tabernacle with God himself, not in a church building or in a, where men build buildings. It isn't a building. The, 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 the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem as a physical rebuilding, that's not, that's not important. It is, what is important is the building of the temple of God on the earth by God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, which will totally unify all of the believers around the world, totally purify all of the believers around the world, and totally empower all of the believers around the world so that they will become one. We will become one. All races who know Jesus. There will be no no longer. Then we will know that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Unalienable rights are God God given rights. Not man given rights. When men give rights and government give rights, they can be taken away. But when God gives rights, they cannot be taken away. All men will attempt to do so. But in their attempt to do so they will destroy themselves. And God will bring destruction on every effort to thwart what he is going to establish. Now, we looked at the end last time at Luke 9, and we were talking about Luke 9 and verse 23. After he has talked to them in the beginning, well, verse 1 first. He called the twelve uh, uh, together. And he gave them power and authority over all demons. And to heal disease. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. The kingdom of God is not a mere verbal proclamation. It is always the proclamation from heaven that men speak. When you speak what God speaks, then what God speaks, if you believe in your heart... What God speaks, power is released to accomplish it, can flow through you, but it is meant to flow through the entire body. One thing the American church, all of us, none of us as Americans have learned, and I don't think any people around the world have totally learned, that Christians, that we are powerful as we are united together in one body. 
I'm seeing that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God is limited when it is just an individual who is baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, we do need to be individually baptized in the Holy Spirit, but as individuals are baptized in the Spirit, move in the Spirit, then the entire body, because the body is going to be raised up to be what I just said, unified, purified, and empowered. The body, the whole body. Uh, whenever I think of unifying the whole body, uh, we can't get one church unified. <laughs> but God is going to unify. It will be a supernatural, miraculous act from heaven. And he's going to move. And then in verse 23, And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow thee. For whoever wishes... To save his life, soul life this is, will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he will save it. The cross. Men individually and men collectively who are Christians, who know Christ, the, the degree to which we exercise the energy of the flesh our own will, our own mind, our own emotions, to the degree we use them, 1%, 10%, 50%, whatever it is, to the degree we use them, we limit power of God in heaven to be released on the earth. Now, God cannot act without us. He's sovereign. That's what the Lord told me a long time ago. When he, was, uh, he said, son, when you teach something from the Word, it, 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 the Word is true. But remember, the Word doesn't contain all the truth I have. Well, the Word in the sense of Jesus does. But I mean what's printed in, in the Bible. What's printed in the Bible can't contain all of the truth of, of God. And so God wants us to understand that the cross is a key to the resurrection. Death, then life. We must die to this world, to our own flesh, to our own mind, will, and emotions, to allow the fullness of what God has accomplished in heaven, the fullness of that salvation to be released on the earth. And so he's going to bring his whole body to take the cross. Oh, boy. Wow. Another miracle. The whole body to take the cross. I want to show you today that that's what the New Testament church did. That's what the New Testament church did. And the Roman Empire, what was used by Satan, was used by God. <laughs> I mean, even what Satan does, God can use. Even what Satan does to try to defeat God. Uh, so go next to Luke 10. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. Two by two, uh, sending out by twos, uh, where two are gathered, or two or three are gathered in your name. There is he in the midst. There's something about having at least two it's a body. It's not just an individual. So he sent them out two by two. And 70, uh, my life was revolutionized when I realized many, many, many years ago, shortly after I was baptized in the Spirit, I uh, read in Matthew 8, it said, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely receive, freely give. And the Lord said, That's for you. And he, I said, Me? Cast out demons? Heal the sick? Raise the dead. I haven't seen that one. Uh, for me? Yeah, for you. The church hasn't caught this yet. Now some have, but we're going to catch it or we're going to miss God. We're going to catch it or we're going to miss God. And he was saying the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. He's looking for laborers. He's not looking. Uh, don't worry about a, your apostle, a prophet, a, a teacher, an evangelist, a, 
um, you know, pastor, don't, don't worry about the, the office titles. Uh, Jesus became a servant. If the king of the world, if the king of kings and the lord of lords, the, the, the one crowned by God the Father himself as king of the universe and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, a priest eternal, if, if Jesus himself, the high king and the high, emptied himself and made himself of no reputation, of no reputation, he had the highest reputation, he makes himself as no reputation. And what the world doesn't know is that as he does that and we do that, that allows God to release power to flow through us so that we can do what he said we would do. You will do my works and greater works. Impossible, but you see, I mean, it's impossible to get saved without God. That's a miracle. I mean, everything that God does is a miracle when it comes from him and his power is released. So the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send laborers out into the harvest. Now, I want you to notice verse 3 here. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. As lambs in the midst of wolves. Now, lambs are pretty helpless. And we are, that, that is used for us who follow Christ. We are more helpless than we realize. And, and, and in the supernatural sense, we're totally helpless. But, I taught this, I, I, I remember one of the, well, several of Glenn Bleck's programs mentioned the Fabian Society. Uh, you probably, if you heard his program, but I, I taught on that, that a long time, uh, many years uh, in teaching history. The Fabian Society took this passage, and by the way, the Fabians, Beatrice and Sidney Webb and uh, Bernard Shaw, other early socialists in England, around the turn of the century, around 1900, were trying to figure out how they could conquer Britain. How could they revolutionize Britain? And they, the Marxist, the, the, the version of the Marx, he, he felt there had to be a violent, open revolution. But to Fabians, it comes from Fabius, who was a Roman general, who used gradualist tactics and deceptive tactics. And so the Fabians took as their symbol uh, a sheep, but wolf, a wolf in sheep's clothing. A wolf in sheep's clothing. We are to be sheep, and in Christ the wolves will not destroy us. But the Fabians, mocking the scripture, felt they were going to overcome Christianity. They knew Christianity was the key enemy. Listen, the, the Muslims understand Christianity is the key enemy. The Marxists understand Christianity is the, three, uh, is the main enemy. All the left understands Christianity is the main enemy. Christ is the main enemy. And so, the Fabians decided that they would penetrate the educational institutions of Britain and get the, uh, the younger generations brought up in Fabian socialism because they believed if they could stamp out Christianity and use these deceptive tactics to infiltrate at every level, particularly at the educational level. They knew at the education... I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to come back to this because, because there's some other scripture here later that uh, uh, points to this where Jesus was talking. Well, it's, it's a little later in Luke 10, but I'll, I'll get there in a minute. But this Fabian tactic is being used today. It's being used in the Obama administration 
to penetrate with socialist and Marxist uh, redistributionist ideas. Same ideas that Marx had, although Marx wanted a violent revolution. The Fabians wanted something that was gradually you would move so that people like the frog in the uh, being heated uh, gradually that people would not notice. I don't think Americans have noticed that we are, we, we are losing our freedom gradually. More, we're losing more freedom, more freedom, more freedom, more freedom, more freedom, more freedom. Well, and we're used to all this force and control. And the enemy is smiling because he knows that this is the kind of thing that he thinks he will win by. Now, turn to verse 8 in Luke 10. I think I'm not going to get the overhead, but anyway. And whatever city you enter, then they receive you, eat what is set before you, and heal those who are uh, 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 sick, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. This is the preaching of the kingdom of gospel, Matthew 24, 14. The kingdom gospel is preaching not just a verbal proclamation, but a proclamation where the word of God gets in your heart and gets in the heart of the entire body of Christ, and as it gets in the heart of the body of Christ, power kingdom gospel will always, always, always release his power. Paul says, once your faith to be based on the power of God. Not doctrine, the power of God. Yes, we need pure doctrine. But if we don't take that pure doctrine into our hearts, believe it and know, and as a body, Because you see, the sevenfold spirit that we're going to be talking about is going to be poured out as the last part of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. And God has shown me very clearly the sevenfold spirit is going to be used to unite the body, the entire body, all around the world. To unite the body all around the world again. To unify, to purify, and to empower the entire body. It's coming, people. I'm excited about it. It's coming. It's coming. And whatever city you enter, and they don't receive you, go into the streets and say, even the dust which clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you, yet be sure the kingdom of God has come near to you. So we go out, and the people who are not poor in spirit, not necessarily poor physically, they may, may, they may be, but poor in spirit, humility, They know they need something. And so the poor in spirit, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. And so God wants us to understand we don't go, we go to where people are hungry. They're hungry for the gospel. If they're arrogant, They think they have all the answers. We go on. We go to those places where God wants us to go. Now, another very, very important key, verse 17. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subdued to us in your name. They were really excited. I remember the first time I saw someone delivered from demon power, I was excited. And every time it's happened since, there is a great exhilaration. There is a great, I mean, how can it be? It isn't me, I know it's God. I'll I'll guarantee you, if you've ever been involved in in casting out demons, you know how, how foolish you can feel. How utterly foolish. Satan has tried to tell me many times, you are crazy. You have lost your mind. <laughs> and we just have to be faithful. And God God works. I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority. Now, there's there's a key. Because all authority was given by the Father to Jesus. And in Revelation 12, there are four things. Authority, 
power, salvation, and the kingdom. And the Lord showed me a long, long time ago, these are the four things Satan hates. Authority is delegated power. But he has given you an uh, authority, but we have got to take it. And we have got to get in the place where we know the scripture and have the scripture in, 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 in our hearts uh, before we can take that authority. We take it as an individual. But the individuals together, united by the power of the Holy Spirit, are to take that authority. The whole body is... See, we're not even close to the whole body taking authority. The whole body of people who call themselves Christians? Taking authority? I mean, half the church, no, more than that, that doesn't even teach that there is such a thing as baptism in the Holy Spirit. I mean, these doctrinal things, these doctrinal things, I, 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 listen, I'm not, I have no idea, so don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I have no idea. Only Jesus knows who's saved and who's not. I don't know who's going to get into the kingdom. I'm not, all I'm saying is that, that God says, Jesus said, John baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And they were, they obeyed. Yes, sir. I like to use that. I use that all the time because the Bible begs to be obeyed. He doesn't, he doesn't want your opinion about the word. <laughs> he doesn't want argument about the word. The Lord showed me a long time ago, quit arguing. I first got saved and baptized in the Spirit. I thought, boy, I'm going to set some of these people straight. <laughs> And I got into a big public argument with a former district superintendent of the Methodist Church in the Grove City United Methodist Church in Pennsylvania. And the Lord convicted me. I thought I won the argument, but I mean, I was arguing for the virgin birth and, and, and the second coming of Christ if he didn't believe it. But the Lord said, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't gain people by arguing. Uh, I mean, you know, no, no need to, to argue over divine healing. I just, when that subject comes up or, or delivers, I just say, well, Jesus healed me. I should have died of cancer. Jesus healed me. I'll tell you about that if you want to know. <laughs> Jesus has delivered me. <laughs> See, if you, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to what you've seen and heard and handled and know. And know. Not just up here. Down here. No, you've experienced. You, you will witness to what you have experienced. That's what First John talks about. That's how you have fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you experience Jesus, and I experience Jesus, then we have fellowship with one another. And that builds the unity of the body. And this is what Christ wants. So, and by way authority, when you begin to take authority, that's what he said in verse 19, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing indeed shall injure you. I, now I, 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 I get I get excited I, 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 how often I have used this and come against Satan. You must resist, resist, resist. Don't ever back away from him. Don't ever turn your back on him. Resist. Firm in your faith. Resist. Firm in your faith. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brethren who are in the world. But after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, shall himself, shall himself, Himself, God Himself, perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be glory and dominion 
forever and ever and ever. Behold, I've given you authority. Then power is released. Then full salvation is released. And that establishes the kingdom. That's the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. Under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. This will defeat the Antichrist spirit. Establishing finally the tabernacle of David. Where God is tabernacling with his people all around the world. And leading them day by day in all things. And nothing indeed shall injure you. Now, verse 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. You want to know a reason to rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks? <laughs> You've been saved. <laughs> By saved, this, uh, the Greek word is sozo. So that means you say spiritually, well, that's, that's the most important. You get into the kingdom. But then you get healed, and you get delivered from demon power. Then you get filled with the Spirit. That's saved too. That's saved too. Same word is used in the scripture. When the Gadarene demoniac was delivered, he was saved. Same word. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he broke the power of Satan. over the body, over the mind. And a lot of Christians receive Christ and spiritually are in the kingdom and, 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 and remain in bondage all their lives because they don't understand that what he did on the cross was complete. He didn't leave anything out that we need. He left nothing out. again. Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. Rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. At this very time, he rejoiced greatly. Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. If anyone asks you whether Jesus ever got happy in the Spirit, uh, he did. He did. David got happy in the Spirit, and Michael didn't like it, thought it wasn't a very uh, 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 becoming of a king. And then David said, I'll become more undignified than this. <laughs> There's a chorus about that, isn't there? Yes. I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thou didst hide these things from the wise and the intelligent and didst reveal them to babes. Now, here's a key. The Holy Spirit will make you wise and powerful but he will reduce you to die out and the whole body to die out so that he can totally control Listen, none of us allows the Holy Spirit to totally control when we are too strong in our own flesh and in our own I, I wish it were different but it isn't it isn't human beings are human beings we all have the same weaknesses and the wise and the intelligent I looked up the Greek word sophos which means intelligent people educated people educated people <laughs> where do you think the Fabians, I said it before, where did the Fabians concentrate? In the universities and colleges and took them over. And I've got news for you. The American universities and colleges, with very few exceptions, few exceptions, have been taken over by liberal, progressive, Marxist professors. Even, now listen now, they have penetrated to control Christian colleges in name and seminaries. Where do you think the roots of Hitler and Nazism were? In the destruction in Germany of the seminaries 
And the penetration, Bruno Bauer and others, the penetration of a gospel that removes the supernatural from the Bible, that puts everything in the hands of men and their ideas and their intellect and their education. Listen, Germany had more PhDs per capita than any place in the world when Hitler took over. Don't you think that education is the answer? If that education is dominated by God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit penetrates in early America up until about 1838 to 40, Horace Mann, he was the first to introduce uh, things in education that came from Germany, and they were liberal, socialist. Uh, uh, all American universities uh, were like the medieval universities. Uh, they were theocentric, which means that you got God up here at the top, and God then creates and controls everything underneath it. So, God, history, you study history, it's his story. You study biology, it's what he created in biology. It's his, you study chemistry, it's what he created in chemistry. It, it, it's, uh, you, 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 whatever you study, you are studying merely what God has created and God controls. And that reduces man. But to penetrate, see, to, 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 if, I, think, I think there are many things we need to do. I think one of the most important things is we need to get people in school boards where the American people will wake up to what textbooks the students are reading and studying. And in my field of history, the textbooks have totally wiped out, except in Christian schools, where you have, like, the Pensacola, uh, 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 that material. But with, that ex with a few exceptions, they have wiped out, totally wiped out, the teaching that Christianity had anything to do with the American founding. And it had everything to do. I mean, how many, how many Asburyans, and I love Asbury, how many Asburyans have I heard say, well, most of the founders were deists. I said, no! They were not. It's not a matter of opinion. That's a lie. You've been taught a lie. But you teach a lie and everyone taught the lie and no one knows the truth. And if you don't go back to the, to the, found, to, to the founders and to the, and to the education uh, 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 that they received. I, you, know, you know high school students in America used to study the Federalist Papers? Every lawyer read the Federalist Papers and Blackstone, the English jurist, before law schools. Man, that would be wonderful. In law school, they, all, all, all they teach is case law, which is totally relativist. There's no truth. A lawyer today doesn't, doesn't have to, he defends his client even if he knows he's guilty and uses every trick, trick and tactic in the book to get his client off. The search is not for truth. The search is for method that they're taught. And that method, it's no wonder, and it isn't just lawyers, I mean, uh, it's, it's, these doctrines have penetrated at every level of our education. Penetrated the law schools. Penetrated. They penetrated the engineering schools very little because it's hard to, it's hard to penetrate math. <laughs> I mean, that's why in the in the universities and colleges, you know, the the the, the scientific uh, part of the of the college uh, is not necessarily radicalized, uh, but. If you look in, in, in history and political science and sociology and psychology and you name it, all the so-called social sciences, there is no such thing, by the way. Don't get me started on that, but there is no such thing as social science. History is not a science. 
you can't make it a science. And it's, it's arrogance. You, psychology is not a science. If you've got two different uh, theories of, of psychology uh, 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 that disagree on a fundamental thing, and you call that discipline science, I mean, uh, we don't disagree on, on, on the laws of thermodynamics because they're universal and provable. Um, now, I want to go next to, and I know I won't get to the overhead, but I want to go next to what happened at Pentecost and how this has to do with the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, what it has to do particularly with the outpouring of the sevenfold spirit and the establishment of the tabernacle of David. Because I don't think there has been sufficient teaching so that even spirit-filled people understand very well. And the Lord has been trying to teach me. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I had a, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD, but I've learned a hundred or a thousand times more from the Lord. Uh, now, 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 uh, you know, education is all right, and higher education is all right if you keep it totally sublimated, sublimated, totally underneath the Word of God and what the Holy Spirit says. But uh, I, I, there, there is no worse pride. The two, the two worst prides are religious pride and educational pride, I think. And God hates pride. He hates pride. Hates it. And, and Moses was the most humble man on the earth. Jesus himself walked in humility. Acts 2, this is Pentecost, Acts 2, verse 17. Let's look, and then we'll go to Acts 10 and Acts uh, 15, because uh, we'll see something that I never saw. It's only in recent years that I've seen this, that God has... uh, By the way, uh, I don't know how old you are. I'm 79, and I'm still learning. And you need to keep learning. I don't care how old you are. You can be 90. You need to keep learning. You need to keep learning. Um, Acts 2, verse 17. I want, I want to try to show you here what happened at Pentecost. See, the day of Pentecost... Uh, it says in, in Acts 1, and the day of Pentecost was fully come. It came at exactly the right time. It wasn't a day early or a day late. It came pentameeting, 50th on the 50th day after Jesus was raised from the grave. I didn't know that for many years. I read it, I, I learned it by reading Messianic literature, Jewish Messianic literature. I didn't know, I didn't know that the first Pentecost according to the Jews was when the Ten Commandments were given. And that was on the 50th day after they came through the Red Sea. Penta, 50th. And then when I learned that Jesus then was raised from the grave on the 50th day after he was, or I mean he, the, the, the 50 days after he was uh, 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 crucified, he was raised from the grave, uh, or 50 days after he was raised from the grave, the, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the earth when he went to the right hand of the Father, I was excited because I, I, I realized that God had Pentecost come at exactly the right time. Now, verse 17 of Acts 2. He's quoting the prophet Joel. So let's see what, what, I'm, what I'm going to do the rest of the period is try to show you what happened in relation to Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and then Acts 10. Because something happened in Acts 10 and then in Acts 15 it's explained more of what happened. And it gives us a a pattern that will be important for us in the end times. I think we're in the end times. And it shall be in the last days that God says, I will pour forth my spirit upon all 
mankind. Now, let me ask you a question. In Acts 2, 1 and 2 and 3, 4, 5, was the Holy Spirit poured out on all mankind? No. No. So this is the beginning. And it was Jews. It was not Gentiles. Gentiles refers to all of the people of the nations. All the nations. So the, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Jews. And the Jew, Jewish believers thought that this wasn't for the Gentiles. But God had to speak to Paul and God had to speak to Peter and give Peter the vision of the sheet to show them that the pouring out of the Spirit of God, because see, the ultimate, the ultimate here is this. Let me read the rest of this. He'll pour out on all mankind, on your sons and your daughters, and they shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in, uh, in the sky above, and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire, and vapor, smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood. Behold, the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come, and it shall be that every one who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, this is the... This is where God moves, and we'll see it begins in Acts 10. God moves them from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So in the beginning, it's not a sevenfold, I call it a sevenfold outpouring. Because seven is the number for completion, perfection. And so in the beginning, it's an outpouring on the Jewish believers. And then the church is established, the New Testament church is established. By the way, James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem, the brother of Jesus. James, by the way, was martyred in 62 AD. So the persecution of the church began right at the very beginning. Because the Roman Empire that controlled in those days was determined to destroy a rival power. And they were determined to destroy the church. I'm going to talk uh, later at the end about the role of persecution. Because the, the role of persecution was quite important so that the believers could understand they need to die as a body of believers as well as individuals. Because out of individual suffering and dying come life. So out of corporate dying of the church comes corporate life to spread the gospel among every, in every nation. In every nation. Because the blood of the martyrs is always the seed for the growth of the gospel of Christ. Because the blood of Jesus has been shed. And through that, there is total victory. And so, go next to chapter four, no, 10. Chapter 10. And uh, verse uh, 38. For you know Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him. God anointed him as high king of the universe and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. With the Holy Spirit and power, Jesus himself, remember, John, didn't, John the Baptist didn't want to baptize, even would water baptized. And Jesus said, no, permit it, permit it. And so he was water baptized, but as he was water baptized, the dove of the Holy Spirit fell on him. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus himself. Now, the, the, I think the only reason for this is that Jesus operated on the earth as a man. He was with God, one with God, but he laid aside the privilege as God. And he ministered as a man. And he was trying to show that men need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. 
By the way, notice that as soon as Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit led him up to be tested by the devil. So, <laughs> if you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and most of you have, you're going to be tested by the devil. You're going to be tested by the devil. Uh, and, and, and Jesus had to meet that. We all have to meet that because we need battle. We need we need to be in battle. A, a, a soldier who has experience in battle is a better soldier. He's a better warrior. And we become better warriors as we experience battle. I don't want to, really. My flesh doesn't want to, but my spirit does. You know that. You know, you know how that goes. Your spirit wants these things. Your flesh doesn't want them. So God anointed him with the Holy Spirit with power. How he went about doing good. And that means he was doing the will of God because you can't be good unless you're doing the will of God. So he was doing the will of God. That's what good is. And healing all who were oppressed by the devil. You know, there is a sense, like when I had cancer and, and I was healed uh, 30 some years ago, um, I didn't have a demon of cancer. It wasn't a demon in me. But that, that disease that, that I could have died with was an oppression ultimately from Satan. Because without Satan's rebellion, there would be no sickness. So I'm not saying all well, sickness is you cast out demons. I don't mean that. It's just that there, there is an oppression. Sickness is an oppression of the enemy. Uh, there, there, uh, Yahweh Rapha is the, the Lord our doctor. There's no Hebrew name for the Lord our disease giver. That's not a part of God, who God is, okay? Now can God allow disease? Yes. But the, the, the nature of God is not to give disease. <laughs> That's not, that's not a part of his nature. So, now, skip down to verse 43. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who were listening to the message. Now, Jews and Gentiles. This is the first time where the beginning of the complete fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. Now it won't be complete until the end in the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom and the return of Christ. But this is the beginning of the fullness of the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom and of the fullness of Pentecost and verse 45, all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles too. I know now why God put into my heart everywhere I went. I never had a class at Asbury College where I didn't at some point in the semester challenge those, those most unbelievers, although not all. Not all students at Asbury. In fact, I'm told by some of the modern students this last year that uh, there are more unbelievers than they've ever seen at Asbury. But anyway, there how many believers there are, I don't know. But uh, uh, the, the, the believers need to be baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And so, and, and it's not, it's not, well, let's see, God says, oh, let's see, you... Uh, there's a check mark. You you were saved. Uh, oh, oh, there is there a check mark. You were baptized. Oh, now now you get in. No, it's it's not. He, he judges individually. He judges the heart. He he. So I, I, I'm sure that a lot of a lot of people who have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit be in heaven. But you cannot, cannot, cannot fulfill the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, the fullness of the sevenfold spirit, and the bringing of the tabernacle of David, and the, and, and the great revival. You can't be a part of that fully unless you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a good thing. It's not a negative thing. Is it there? You know, did you do that? Uh, <laughs> It's not that way. That's not, not the way God thinks. And for they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit. This time they got baptized in the Spirit, then they got water baptized. 
Usually it's water baptism and baptism in the Holy Spirit. Um, and he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So, now go to Acts 15. See, this is the beginning. Acts, uh, Acts 10 is the beginning of the expansion of the Pentecost into a preaching where the sevenfold spirit begins to be manifested and where you begin to get believers all around the world baptized in the Holy Spirit as well as saved. Because without that, they can't move where the power of God can move freely. Because, see, if, you don't, if you're not baptized in the Spirit, you can't really move in the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. And if you're not baptized in the Spirit, you, 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 you can't release the fullness of perfect love written in your heart. It's got to be written in your heart first, like it was written on the tablets of stone by the Holy Spirit. And he'll write love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and gentleness and meekness and faithfulness and self-control in your heart. And then every day of your life is up to you to, by faith, release that. Don't, don't release your own... Well, never release anger or bitterness or resentment. Uh, repent of that. But even your own human love... The best thing you have. You need Jesus' love. You need Jesus' patience. Be more patient. No, you need Jesus' patience. You, you, God writes that in your heart. And so, if you will receive it by faith, being baptized in the Spirit, then release it day by day by day by day. If you're in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Continue to walk daily in the Spirit. You can... You can then you can uh, you can do what God wants you to do, and you'll be prepared for what's ha- going to happen at the end. Now, Acts 15. We'll close today on Acts 15, um, and let's look at verse seven. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, "Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you." And that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing or purifying their hearts by faith. That's what I was just talking about. When you baptize in the Spirit, you're not only empowered, but you are cleansed, you are purified. God writes the law of love in your heart. And you never get over that. I think the greatest test of being baptized in the Spirit is not whether you speak in tongues or prophesy or other supernatural miracles. I think is, is, are you full of perfect love which flows day by day by day? How do you treat your family? I'll tell you, that's the place. That's the place where God will show you up as to whether you are full of perfect love. <laughs> If you can love your wife and your children and your and, and and people in your family, I mean, love them with God's love, taking the cross, emptying yourself. That's the greatest test, and God wants to fill you that way. Now, I never knew, but let me go on here. Verse 12, And all the multitude kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating signs and wonders that God had done through them. Now, you know, signs and wonders are going to begin to occur. We don't look for the signs and wonders separate from Jesus, but they are going to occur, if you will believe. The power of God is in you. I mean, signs and wonders will occur. I think more and more and more. Because as evil grows more evil, Good of God, power of God. I mean, we haven't seen anything yet as to what God is going to do. We will be totally astounded and amazed what God is going to do. And the angels are going to intervene more and more. And after verse 13, they had stopped speaking James. This is the brother of Jesus, the organizer of the church at Jerusalem, the first New Testament church. But this first New Testament church, do you know what James believed? Do you know what they believed? They had restored the tabernacle of David. 
They had restored the tabernacle of David. They, they, were, they were covenanting it with God Himself. He was coming to them and they were tabernacling with God. Not just in a temple. Not just in a building. But they were tabernacling with God. The New Testament church. Next time I'll talk about the persecution. But the New Testament church was baptized in the blood of Jesus and the blood of the martyrs. I'll talk next time a little bit about the ten imperial persecutions beginning in, in Nero's time. And Nero was the one who ordered the crucifixion of, of Peter. I think I won't do that today. I think I'll do that next time. I was going to draw something on it. But the crucifixion of Peter upside down because he didn't want the same honor as Jesus had had. And then I remember, and I'll close with this, uh, being in Rome in 1977 with uh, Bill Gould, who was an Asburyan and taught at Asbury College. And, and uh, now, well, I, I don't know whether he's retired from the seminary or not, but anyway, he, went, he moved to the seminary. But we went together to go to uh, uh, Rome uh, with an Asbury uh, couple, missionary couple, living in Rome because they wanted to have their first revival and they asked me to preach it in Rome. And so we went there, but as we were there, we toured the city of Rome, the most interesting city I've ever been in, I think. Anyway, uh, we went into the, to the cell where they held Paul. And it, it, uh, it, it only has an entrance by going down. There's a, oh, a hole, something like this, and you go down a ladder. And it was carved out of a, of a cave. And so we were down in there. Bill was a song leader musician. And so we were singing hymns and praising God and weeping and, <laughs> and rejoicing uh, as we remembered the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul then was taken out. Uh, a little outside, six, five, six miles outside the city of Rome in the circus of Nero and beheaded. Uh, but the blood of the martyrs is a seed of what's coming where collectively, again, the seventh Holy Spirit, the completion, the completion, the completion, seven, the number of completion, the completion of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. This will defeat Satan. This will defeat the Antichrist. This, don't fear anything that's happening. Don't fear. Look, don't get your eyes on individual things that are happening. Don't get your eyes on an earthquake. Don't get your eyes on a famine. Don't get your eyes. Get your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on Jesus. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Mm, yes. Oh, God. <laughs> Oh, oh, get your eyes on Jesus. Every, every morning I try to get my eyes on Jesus. Yes, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He is. He is. Well, let's pray. Father, we just, we just thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus, that you are the glorious one. One like the Son of Man who was in the seven full spirit. And in the with the, the flowing uh, gown down to your feet in the golden girdle uh, with the eyes uh, like a burning uh, a bush God uh, yes Lord uh, with with all with all with all the feet of burnished bronze glowing like in a furnace with a sword of the Spirit in your mouth, yes, Lord, uh, with a face bright shining as the sun. John fell down as if dead, God, before you. And so I pray, Lord, that you will help us to get a vision of who you are and what you want and what you're going to do. We know you're going to pour out your spirit, the sevenfold spirit. We know you're going to prepare us. We know you're going to lift us. We know you're going to move. So take away all fear. Take away all fear. Take away all fear. You haven't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of sound mind. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Father, give us hearts to absorb the word. Thank you that we have ears to hear. Father, give us a heart to absorb it. To take it in. We might meditate and understand deeply within our spirit where we're at right now. What we've heard. Let us know and understand. Bless the Lord. Bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace passing all your understanding. Blessings and favor that you cannot even contain yes, and will overwhelm you and overtake you throughout these days. Yes, Lord. And that there is grace there far more sufficient than any encounter you will ever meet. Yes, because the Lord God Almighty is in it. Amen. Father, as we've heard, we'll have no fear. We'll allow no fear to enter any place in our body, in our hearts. Lord God, in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. And I bless you with health and wealth and well-being throughout these days, with creative ideas, inventive thinking, aligned with the mind of Christ and the will of God. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 By the way, before we close, Cornelia class, no class next week. You got a, we got a, you got a Sunday off. Alvin and I are going to be in Montgomery, Alabama, <coughs> visiting with my daughter. And you got a week off. And we're blessed as we're there. And we'll see you on the 16th again. I think that's what it is. Can I make an announcement? We're going to leave the chairs. Come up front where you can be heard. We're going to leave the chairs just like they are. We don't need to move them. And I want to remind you that Wednesday we'll begin our prophecy series. Uh, in this room at 7, we'll start probably at 7.15. Okay. We'll have about 70 or so. Okay, Chuck Messler, Perry Stone, some of those guys. Right. See, did you say in this room, probably? this room. Yeah. One day. Yeah, we got right out. Out. We got right out. I don't see any of my Yeah. Okay. Okay. Have you been to any of those privacy conferences? Oh, I have. I haven't heard of this year. Usually, usually here. Thank you, I all love to cry. Our prayers go with you as you go. I'll be thinking about you all. Oh, oh, well, we're going to cut it down this time. It's eight hours. Oh, it's a day. Oh, yes. So we're going okay. to go four hours today. Five back to Tennessee. It's been a day and a half. We like to go on a holiday because we don't have all that traffic. So, you know, it's right. It's right. Oh, it's wonderful. Wish we could come back without any traffic. How long will you get to stay? A week from yeah. Monday. Yes, it would be because the fourth is Monday. Okay, so we're coming back on the eleventh. Okay. Does he come back with Bob? I mean, we'd love to have you come back with Bob. Oh, same thing. Yes. The only time I can't is if there is something that I, you know, family or the family that their mom's hundred dollars. I understand that. I love 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 that.